Welcome to Prophecy Made Easy. Um, before we kick into what we're going to talk about, like a little bit of an introduction, etc., I think to set the scene, uh, to put your minds into a bit of thought process, etc., around what you want to get out of these talks, uh, around what your apprehensions might be about prophecy, I've got a few quiz questions to come up. Um, so either open up your mics or type into the chat bubble for these next five slides. So these will introduce you to some, some quite interesting facts about the Bible prophecy in general. Um, fire away, Ron. Next slide, please. Oh, that's a good point. Right. Ooh. I'll bring my mouse Ooh. over onto the right screen. Sorry, this is... <laughs> all good, all good. This is this is technology with two people on it. Right. Sorry. Here we go. All right. Open your mics up. Open your thought process up. Approximately how many Bible prophecies are there? Think about that question. Um, go again, Ron. You might. There's some options to come up. Here we go. Approximately how many? 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. Bear in mind, any quiz starts easy, so I'm sure we're going to get this. Anybody? Somebody on the chat, who's who's going for it? Who's going for it? They've all gone. All gone. Robert and well. Sharon came in first with 6,000. You are absolutely right. Ella, you were almost there. 6,000 Bible prophecies. Now, the, the, the website I got for this from says supposedly 3,000 have already been fulfilled. So half of Bible prophecy has been fulfilled. And to me, I, th I think that's amazing. 6,000 prophecies is an incredible number. All right, next question, Ron. Right. How many prophetic books does the Bible have? Do a quick count on your hand and you hear how many prophetic books does the Bible have? Um, yeah, less than 10, between 11 and 15, or more than 15. Oh, I see Ella's learning. Exact. Oh, no, hang on. It's more than 15, Ella. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I think we tricked you into that one. It is more than 15. Absolutely right. It's, uh, I think it's around 17, from what I remember. 17 prophetic books of the Bible. So again, we, we're starting to get a little bit of a picture, aren't we? There's 66 books of the Bible, and 17 of those are on prophecy or prophetic books themselves. Uh, yep, next question, Ron. So, uh, and we'll go for the next bit. We'll put the, the true or false bit up as well, or else it seems it's a weird question. True or false, there are at least 68 confirmed prophets. Laura answered so quick. I think she's listening to me in the background too. Yeah, next, and reading your notes, Robert. <laughs> and reading and reading notes. No, it's um, not, not this time. It is absolutely true. Absolutely true. There are at least 68 confirmed prophets. You wouldn't think that, would you? If there are only 17 prophetic books, there is more than 68 prophets in the whole Bible. And why do I say more? Because we know that the 68 are confirmed, as in they're either written about directly or somebody referred to this person or, you know, verses were used in a sense of context and history, etc which again, that's that's an amazing amount of people that God uses for his word, right? Uh, next question, Ron. Here we go. I, I think we'll catch out a few people here. Who was the first prophet? Oh, oh. Robert. Ah. I think Robert, the chief. Robert, that was great. <laughs> <quick. laughs> no, 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 no. Robert, Robert's not a person to cheat. He is correct. Um, Ron will bring up the answer. It is actually Abel. There is that right. verse Robert that Jesus the uses <laughs> of the prophets, their blood being spilt from Abel through to Zechariah. And when Jesus is talking in context of the prophets and he uses Abel in that same that same description of prophets, and it's like, 
I actually don't know what uh, Abel's prophetic sort of work was. Maybe it was showing his brother what he was meant to do. But um, yeah, he was the first prophet confirmed. And then the next question, Ron, it's about the uh, the last prophet. This could be a tricky one. It kind of depends on what you believe in time periods, what you believe in sort of family lineage, where these people were, what they were doing. Oh, Ron. <laughs> Too quick. What up the answer? <laughs> 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 We um we did leave. By the way, Jesus I agree Christ. with brother. <laughs> I agree with brother. Anyone who's got able that quick must know the answer. So I'm just going to ask Robert from now on. <laughs> I'd actually say Robert. Ooh. Robert would probably be right too. I didn't put Jesus on that list. So um yeah, these these people here, they're all around the same time period, right? 80, 60, 70, sort of that just after Jesus has been resurrected and then gone up to heaven, okay? And even Philip's daughters. So you might believe that Philip's daughters kept on prophesying after Philip died. So they could potentially be the last people on earth who were prophets from the Bible, which is, so it's fascinating to see how broad this idea of prophecy is in the Bible, how much God uses it, who he uses to send out his word. So that it's hopefully going to get you into the, the mindset of what we're looking at and how much it expands the Bible itself. Um, if you go to the next slide, Ron, we've uh, got some questions to bring up for our bubbles. What I would like you in your bubbles to do is contemplate some of these questions for a few minutes. Um, definitely run to myself, we're also going to talk through them, but um, please, in your bubbles, have a discussion around how you think prophecy can affect your daily life. Like, what does it do for you now? What does it convince you about? What does it motivate you to do? What do you expect to get from prophecy? Do you think it's confusing? You give up on it? Do you want absolute answers from it or are you just happy to sort of think about dreams and visions why do you get frustrated when you read prophecy do too many people tell you conflicting things does it annoy you do you sort of find it sort of anxious and angsty you just don't want to get into arguments with people and as we've seen as well why why did god write all of this why has he done it and is it for me now, I'll give you a few minutes to talk about that. I think um might be good for us, actually, Ron. What what can prophecy yeah, yeah. do for you? Yeah, I, I guess, um, like, when I think about it, I think it's it comes down to um, either uh, a means of which you need to uh, get prepared or a means by which you might stay prepared. So it's like two things. It's like God's God's either saying you need to get ready, and this is a wake up. So the prophets came and they said, "Wake up! You're falling asleep. Lots mm -hmm. of stuff mm -hmm. is going to happen, and you're not ready for it." Yep. Or it was an encouragement to those who were already faithful to say, "Don't worry. Trust. You're going to see all of these things happen. Keep trusting in me." So you had two classes of people: either the people that needed to wake up or people that were already ready. So that's kind of the way I see it. And I think really all prophecy, that's what it's about. It's about us getting ready for Jesus. So, mm -hmm. No, completely. Yeah, I, I kind of feel as well that it, it helps me understand that the world that I see outside is related to the Bible through events that happen as well. So it's got the really good connection between the physical world, between like governments or natural events that happen and how all those things can tie into symbols that I see in prophecy too. So it's got that really amazing connection. Um, and, and I think your point is that, you know, there's so much of the Bible that is prophecy. There's a massive amount of the Bible that's prophecy. So it is obviously very important. And the question is, was it just important for the people of the day or does it, you know, like, and, and oh, 
the, the big one that I would really challenge as we go through this series is that comment you made that generally people believe that 50% of all prophecy, was it 50% or more that you said is being fulfilled? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 would, I would say maybe they, um, you know, that, that concept is because they're limiting how they're viewing it, which is obviously what we want to get into. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. do you so feel we've got some lot got some good things for you? So we've got some uh, comments here. Ruth uh, from the Pakaranga Inn has said, "Keeps our faith strong as we see prophecy happening today and as we contemplate those fulfilled in the past." So, yep, that's good. Thank you, Ruth. It's nice. Yeah. So Anybody you, else you've put a lot of work out this one. Do you get frustrated by prophecy? Um, I used to get a lot more frustrated. Uh, uh, I don't now, um, and and I want to talk through that. I used to get really frustrated. It used to, it used to do my head in when I couldn't. It was like trying to solve a puzzle and I couldn't fit the pieces together. Um, and 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 I I suppose because I was led to us believe that you know prophecy was all about this and the picture was already created for me and yep. I struggled to see that I struggled to see the picture and then I struggled to see an alternative yeah, yeah. Uh, good, um, so good. yeah definitely yeah. definitely used to get frustrated and hopefully what we're going to talk about is some things as to why I don't get frustrated about <laughs> prophecy anymore and Josh said to me when we first started doing this, he he wanted me to give him the one, you know, the one minute pitch as to as to why, you know. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Listen in, people. <laughs> I haven't got the one minute pitch, <laughs> but 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 I think you know it's it, it is like it's that quote you know, in Proverbs, it's the honor of kings, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and the honor of kings to search it out. Mm -hmm. and, the, right. and the thing with what God does is concealing things, just like parables, is he does give you certain keys. And, and the frustration, I think, comes from actually not knowing what those keys are. And so mm -hmm. you're in the realm all the time of guesswork. And there's yep. nothing wrong yep. with in the realm of guesswork, which we'll talk about, but yeah, anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, do you reckon we've got time to open this up? Do you want some more comments to come in on this? Uh, I, I suppose we're getting them from the chat. Does anybody want to, uh, frustration, question, ambiguity of time frames, confusion over the symbols, previously biased about interpretation. Love it. Oh, that's Love it. There's yeah. a, there's a whole other things in there yeah. Laura says, and yep. that was probably exactly where I was a number of, well, a fair while ago. Yep. I think we should carry on, Reese, because we've um, <laughs> we've got a fairly decent section before our next bubble challenge. Oh, that's right. <clears throat> Be prepared, guys. Ron has got some amazing stuff to share, so let's carry on then. Where you go, Ron? <laughs> <laughs> um, so. So what I want to do first of all is is just say um, this. <laughs> this is a great slide, and uh, I I love this slide because I think you know when we talk in our community in particular about prophecy, this is what tends to happen. As soon as somebody talks about maybe deviating from, um, you know what what we might call traditional interpretation, <laughs> there is just this mm. absolute a ghast shock horror yep yep um and and we want to kind of address that as to why that is uh i would say it was 30 years ago when i went to wanganui to listen to murray beale talk about systematic prophecy and i'd have to say i went there with a little bit of the view um as a bit of a young upstart because i had heard murray had radical ideas on prophecy and I was going to sort of um, address these things that he talked about and and come back and hopefully uh, put them right. <laughs> um, and, and Murray didn't actually present anything that was controversial at all. Murray presented something in regards to a, a system of understanding prophecy and after he'd done this series 
I chewed over it and I was a little bit like, hmm, I will hear thee again on this matter. Since right, that time, right. I have now listened to Murray several times. I've read his notes and I've chatted to him uh, on numerous occasions. And he does know that um, we're presenting uh, a Ooh, lot of cool. what he's going to talk about or, or that he says. Um, so just, just, just for those people background. that maybe are listening that don't know Maury, like if you're not from our community, Maury is a real character to our, our church community, right? So if you don't know who he is, it doesn't really matter, but a lot of his information that he's written about, that's what Ron's talking about here. Yeah, he's a fantastic Bible student and he's got a very, very sharp mind. He is a physicist engineer, so he likes to see things structured and organized. and and one of the things Maury says in terms of his systematic prophecy is that he, in his life in the truth, I think when I heard him talk about this, he said he'd been like 45 years, um, you know, as a believer. And over that 45 years, he said there's perhaps two good ideas that he's had. And it was like, right, so you've had like two great ideas. And this is one of them. I never found out what the other one was, but it says this, this woke him up at sort of, you know, three o'clock in the morning and it was one of those things that he jumped out of bed and he wrote down before it just evaporated out of his brain and it was all about how we come to know something how we draw our right. conclusions and, and and one of the things with prophecy is I think we need to understand that prophecy has in it and particularly bible prophecy it is a unique language so so in order to understand a language, sometimes you'd need to know more than just the language. You need to know the culture of the people that are speaking that language to understand what they mean. And, um, you know, I, I, you get that, of course, when you travel overseas and sometimes you see road signs which are quite foreign to the way, mm -hmm. you know, we would have road signs in New Zealand. And, if you didn't know a little uh, bit, uh, you could actually get quite confused. So I've got this little <laughs> picture of this um, this this Roman guy here, and he's playing golf. And for Darren listening, you'll know that golf has a unique language associated to him. And he's he's shouting out in Roman, "What is my favourite number on the golf course?" And <laughs> and and that is the number four. <clears throat> and and I think this is a really good illustration of of a unique language within the construct of of something so in golf this right. is a unique language and yep. and for years i played golf and thought i had no idea of why they yelled out for the idea is if you you know skew your ball like i often do and your ball goes off in a wild direction and it heads towards players you yell out for and and that's for them the signal to put their hands on their head and duck <laughs> unless they get hit by a missile now i want you to think about that because i think that's a great analogy in terms of prophecy and and prophecy language so mm -hmm. where did this idea in golf come from and surprisingly they're not yelling out the number four one two three four the word is actually four as in B4 or R4, yeah. um, F O R E. And the idea behind it goes right back to um, infantry in the army, where um, those that were a four were those that were in front. So when they marched forward in infantry, the guys in the front, those were the guys that got the short straw. That's the place where David put Ahithophel. You know, they, um, sorry. Uh, Uriah, Uriah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So you put them at the fore front of the battle, and um, you know that that's definitely where they get the short straw. Um, and if they don't get hit by enemy fire, if that's not bad enough, they then have the problem with the second infantry behind them standing up to shoot. And if they don't duck and get out of the way, well, they're going to get a bullet in the back of the head. So what happens is the guys behind, when they stood up, would yell out four. And that gave right. the infantry yeah. guys in front the opportunity to duck. Now, what <laughs> happens if you didn't know that language? Uh, what if, if that infantry wasn't trained and the guy behind four, yeah. and they thought it meant to stand to attention? 
and they popped that, stood to attention, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> wouldn't go so well with them. Yep. And yep. And prophecies, I, I think the language of prophecy is exactly like that. So what we want to do in this series is show that there are certain symbols, signs, structure, and patterns and themes within prophecy that once you kind of understand the structure and the symbols and the signs and the patterns, they are reoccurring. Mm -hmm. And you can build from them your own prophetic language which helps you to make or to come to an educated understanding of what it means. So yeah. that's kind of the introduction. The four major ways we come to know something that Mori has talked about are direct statements, parallel passages, inference, and hypothesis, or what we might call guesswork. So we're going to have a look at those those now, and I'm just going to throw this over to Reese to talk about. And Whoa. the first one, and the and and number one right at the top, the most important of all ways we can understand something from the Bible is this one. So talk us through this one, Reese. Great statements. I mean, basically, it is what the statement says, isn't it? So, like Max, I am going to the beach tomorrow, right? So, there's no way that you should be able to confuse what Max is doing, what he says he's doing, where he's going to go, when he's going to go, what is maybe what his purpose, and that's probably not part of it. But enough of the direct statement is there for pretty much clarity. There's no confusion um it's the the whole point of what max is doing going to the beach tomorrow um some literary writers say that they use it to report the exact words spoken or used by a speaker or writer yeah so when we look into a book and we read about a character or we listen to music or the newspaper there are all these uses of direct statements sometimes what they call reported speech as well and you can recognize it straight away by the use of pronouns right so max is like i i am doing this it's like okay so i can see there's the pronoun there's a direct statement going on right now so, pretty much so to this, me this so this yeah. is the most reliable, isn't it, of all the yeah. of, of yeah. all met because because it's the least ambiguous, isn't it? Or, or the le it's hard to misconstrue something. But you know, can you misconstrue a direct statement? Can you get it sort of wrong? Or is is there things we you have to watch out for? I, I think you you can get it wrong. Um, what you need to be aware of is context, as in when it's used. So like Max is going to, to the beach and his context is for tomorrow. So if we don't have that information, that decent amount of information, we can confuse when Max is going to go to the beach, right? So if you take a, a religious statement like Jesus says, I am going to die. Yeah. And that's what he told his disciples, right? So there's a direct statement of Jesus telling his disciples, I'm going to die. And even they couldn't understand what Jesus is saying. So sometimes it's our own bias. It's like, what do we want? What did the disciples want from Jesus? So they wanted the kingdom on earth. They wanted their king to do all these amazing things. And it's like his direct statement, oh, whatever. Don't believe it. Don't want to hear it, right? And yet that's it, it's so amazing, explicit. isn't it? Because yeah. it, like it wasn't just one direct statement, wasn't it? It was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to, the son of man's going to Jerusalem. He's going to be yep. betrayed to the religious yep. leaders, he's going to be mocked, he's going to be set at ray, he's going to be beaten, he's going to be scourged, he's going to be crucified, and then he'll raise the third day. Now that's pretty yeah, clear, yeah. isn't it? I mean, like he's just yeah. he's just laid it all out there. And then it says, and they understood not that saying. Yep. So, yep. so you're right. It's I mean, sometimes people can be absolutely crystal clear. It's not ambiguous. The problem is with the listener isn't exactly it? With, exactly as opposed yeah. to the person that's saying it so yeah that's yeah. a good point pros and cons of direct statements be careful so i i think even in that context is like it's it's exactly it what did they want from jesus you know what what was the history what was the kind of 
the time period and what they were thinking about in relation to what Jesus wanted to do. So when we read these statements, you kind of have to take a bit of that into account when you read the statement. So you have it right in front of you and it's right, what's the context around all of this? What's the story being developed that can then help me understand the statement too? And and I, you know, I think the other uh, point about that might be that um, it, it's often defined, as you say, by context. I, I know a really good one in John chapter five, where mm-hmm. Jesus says, you know, there comes a time that all of those that are asleep shall be raised. And by reading right. that just on its own, you might think Jesus is teaching universal resurrection. But you have yeah. to look at his context really careful to see that he's saying the time is coming and now is when those yeah. that are in the grave. So people were yeah. being raised right then when Jesus was talking. And he's talking about a spiritual resurrection. You know, he's talking about people who are dead in their sins and trespasses yeah. awakening to this teaching. Um, yeah. and, and you kind of have to see the context of it. Otherwise, you might, you know, you might be a bit confused. So context yeah, is important yeah. to a direct state. Yeah. What what I like about this, and this is probably why I also think it's so, it's probably what I would call number one kind of point or tip, even of reading the Bible, to be fair. It's like God is our father, right? And as a father, he is trying to help you all the way. So he's not going to trick you. He's not going to give you bad information. So to help you live the life that he wants you to do, he's like, don't touch the hot stove. You know, any parent does that. So that's what God is trying to do with us. He's giving us direct statements all the time to help us understand what his plan and his purpose is. So that's that's my reason why I, I think this is such an important tip to understand the Bible and prophecy itself. And I think the most important, as you say, the most important things that we know of are generally presented as direct statements. These are the things God wants us to know. So he makes it really clear. Um, I wonder if anybody in their bubble can think of um, a a direct statement, perhaps in relation to prophecy, which is really clear, unambiguous, no symbols, nothing that you have to, you can just look at it and it says what it says. And and we build our faith upon these sorts of things. So this is, you know, when you when you get a direct statement in prophecy, this is uno number one, highlight it, mark it. You're gonna build things around direct statements. Can anyone think of one? Maybe put it in the chat bubble. Acts one verse oh, eleven, brilliant. Absolutely oh. brilliant. Robert again is right on Robert, the money. I know, I know. Should we put them at the back of the class? Because they're always answering these things. <laughs> oh, this is brilliant. So, so Acts 1 verse 11, this same Jesus, is that the one? I think it is, isn't it? Yes. This same Jesus, as you've seen go into heaven, is going to come again in like manner. So like this is, this is a direct statement, teaching Jesus' return. Um, yeah. And another one might be, um, God has appointed a day in which he will adjudge the world in righteousness by that man jesus christ yep. what's that quote who knows that quote anybody got that one there god has appointed a day in which you will judge uh, the world Acts 17 i think x 17 verse 30. ah oh, brilliant so you can get yeah, it's one of stephen's speeches uh, paul's speeches oh, yeah. back into Acts 17. excellent yeah, so you again go. you know like, sometimes you're going to get direct statements and what hmm. what we're going to suggest in this is that when you study prophecy, look for the direct statements, look for the things which are unambiguous and then highlight them in your Bible direct statement, clear crystal. Yep. Right. Brilliant. Shall we move on to the next way we come to understand stuff? And this is kind of a little bit unique in terms of, you know, um, the way I suppose we come to understand stuff from the Bible. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, talk, yeah, talk us through this one, right? Parallel passages, right? So, 
a strong method of parallel passages is where you would either see a phrase or a word and then it's like, ah, oh, I know that's from somewhere else in the Bible. And then you can go to that next passage that you remember and it's like, does the context of the situation sort of fill in the information that I'm lacking in this story or this this prophecy, et cetera, that I'm looking at? Now, a really good example of what we're, we're saying here is like, you know, when Jesus was raised to life again and he's on this road to a city called Emmaus and he's got two of his disciples on the same road. And as he walks past, he's, he's kind of disguised to them and they're like, oh, our master died and we don't know what to do. And Jesus starts to say to them, well, all right, I'm telling you from the Psalms and the law and all these other books of the Bible what the purpose of Jesus was. So as we said back before, direct statements, I am going to die. I am going to be crucified. They couldn't get that. So then Jesus starts showing them parallel passages. And then the eyes were like opened. Oh, you're him. That's the whole point, right? So yeah. sometimes if our bias is too strong or we want the wrong thing, then parallel passages can actually help to answer a lot of the confusing questions, right? So, so would you say, you know, like, I mean, this is some, this is a real common thing that we do. I guess it's something I love. I, I love parallel passages, um, mm. particularly if you can, if you can find, you know, I, I guess there's good and bad parallel passages. You can find oh, yeah. something yep. which, which you've just made a connection by a word, but, uh, and it might say one word, but it might be completely out of context. So you've got to be a little yep. bit careful, I guess. Um, yep. So, so why would you say that type of thing is, is when you're making a poor parallel passage? You got any <laughs> a dumb? No, it's like it's I, I, I it's um, it's I not suppose really if you look at if you look at your cars lined up there, that's perfect yeah. parallel parking. Um, whereas that's probably not, eh? I mean, that's, oh, that's yeah. I mean, this this guy's tried to shove his thought, his car, into a place where it should not be. Right. So he's he's found a phrase that fits something that he wants to make right. That's pretty much where I put it down to. He's using what we might say a type instead of an actual phrase and just building on that type and not tying it back in with any other information except his own desired conclusion. And often we get that. We get a lot of people that try and build a story of something fanciful because it's what they want it's what they want religion to be and then they just take little bits of the bible all over the place and fit it into this this crazy thing that they want and and i guess the more you can line up parallel passages by by nature of the same phrase or context the stronger mm. your argument becomes mm. Yep. because people yep. can see consistency so yep. if you suddenly have parallel passages that are in conflict with other parts of the bible it's 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 obviously a little bit of a disarray parking space so yeah, i yeah. think you know yeah. like that's a really good example in parallel passages just it, there it's a really good method but you need to be you know aware of when mm. you've got that crowbar and forcing your way into this space. I mean, it's just, there's um just go to the next one. I think Ron, this is probably part of the um what you might say the pros or cons around parallel passages. It might need some Bible knowledge. So if you're not too confident with reading the Bible or reading prophecy, for instance, it might take a little bit more dedication to use this technique. Um, sometimes it's it's quite simple in a sense if you want to use that word like say genesis 1 has so many connections to john chapter 1 right and you can pick them up straight away because it's like light and dark and in john it's like light 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 you know so those connections straight away and then you might get phrases like horns or stones or dragons and you're like what the heck is this and of course <laughs> that needs a bit of time a little bit of dedication just to use this method what do you cool. think about pros and cons, Ron? 
<clears throat> Excellent. No, I think that's really good. I think that's um, I I would say you know in our in our um, discussion so far in terms of how we come to understand something or interpret something, we could put number one Uno number <clears throat> one direct statements, and then you build on that parallel passages. So if you can tie parallel passages back to a direct statement, then you're even stronger you know you're 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 fairly rock solid um, yeah 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 completely yep cool like so it. so the third um the third way <laughs> we come to understand things um because I'm, I'm conscious of time so we should probably push along is what we is in third con conclusions or inference and um this is this is uh is where you get the idea of um, deducing something, concluding something from evidence, reasoning um, uh, based on your understanding. Now, this is another very good method. Now, Jesus used this method, um, and, and you can think of a number of occasions where he used this method. Um, there's another example, which I think is a fantastic example, which is the story of Abraham when he offered up Isaac. And it's the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 that says of Abraham that Abraham believed God and he was willing to offer up Isaac. And it actually says he offered him up knowing that God would raise him from the dead. So and 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 so much so that is his conviction was so strong that God would raise him from the dead. It was as though Abraham actually offered up Isaac. He was so prepared to do that. And the question is, how did Abraham come to that understanding? And the answer is from inference. So God had told Abraham directly that your son Isaac, through your son, you're going to become a great and powerful nation. Problem was, Isaac didn't have any kids. So here was God saying to Abraham, go and kill Isaac, offer him as a sacrifice. And Abraham went, yeah, but I'm going to become a nation through Isaac because you told me that. So the only way that can happen is as if you intervene or if I kill him, you've got to raise him again. So he was so convinced that God must raise him from the dead. So that's a, that's inference based on an understanding of God and what you might call an immutable law. And the immutable law was God does not lie. So True. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that his knowledge, he deduced this by um, a belief based on an immutable law. Now, I'm going to suggest that a lot of our understanding um, concerning our doctrines come a lot from inference. You know, our, our conviction of the fact that, you know, there can't be a supernatural devil because all of a sudden that's a conflict of an immutable law that God is the only source of power or right. that Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust, says James, and enticed. It wouldn't make any sense. Mm. By inference, you can't have a supernatural devil. Yep. Um, so, so we so, build a lot of our doctrines on inference. So it's a, yeah. it, it's it's good, but I'd say pros and cons. What would they be? Do Do you think? Uh, um, any Bible student can use inference? Like, do, do you need to have a lot of knowledge or is it more your confidence and your own understanding? Um, I, I think, as I say, you know, it still ties back to probably direct statements. Right. Or, or a little bit of an understanding, I guess, of say things like the character of God, the nature of God, the nature of man, yep. and, and an overall understanding of his plan and purpose. So yep. by that, you can, you can, so you do need, like, as I say, inferences based on deducing. So it's an in, uh, in intellectual 
um, conclusion drawn from understanding. So I guess you do need to have some understanding, which is what these, you know, signs here. If you don't have any understanding or in intellect about what's going on here, these signs could be mighty confusing. And, and what's right. your inference yeah. that you're going to draw from when you see these signs mm. um, can be very confusing. Yeah, right. But I think we not, should move it's on. It's not to put people off trying to learn about things, is it? It's not saying this is a difficult thing to get your head into. Yeah. So let's move on because we 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 we're racing through this. So oh, this next again, one. Hold your head. Yep, here we go. Because <laughs> this is the, the next one's the big one. <laughs> So the next one's the really big one. So uh, it, again, if you look at how we come to understand things, number one, direct statements. Um, I would say inference is up there with parallel passages and direct statements, but it is built on understanding. And parallel passages really built on both of those. Um, the last one is what we call hypothesis, which in the end, no matter which way you look at it, hypothesis is just guesswork it's theory so you know here's a picture of you know somebody who turned around and says wow you know the pyramids are so amazing i believe they must have been built by aliens and so they create this guess and then people corroborate the evidence to prove it and and when you once you start on this man you can find anything you know that's why people <laughs> you know they've got a whole flat earth society you get a ridiculous theory and then you build the corroborative evidence around it and you can make it sound convincing. You can get believe people it. believing that there's a flat <laughs> earth and there's a whole conspiracy out there. You know, like they say, Australia doesn't exist. You know, the the, the coronavirus is just something which is out there. It's a, it's a plan by, you know, world governments. Um, Bill Gates is behind it all, basically because he wants to depopulate the world. And corroborative evidence comes from everywhere with these wacky theories. Right, right. So I think the biggest thing with the hypothesis is we have to understand that when you make a guess or you make a theory, there is a large amount of personal bias in there. Um, but sometimes, you know, you get what you call an educated guess. So you can think of something, you know, one of my great hypotheses that I really love is that the rich young ruler that comes to Jesus is Barnabas. Mm -hmm. And I, like I can produce lots and lots of uh, evidence around that story and build an argument that would just have you convinced that it is. But the thing is, no matter what, it's still a hypothesis. You yep. cannot, I cannot know that it is fact at all, no matter how much I draw parallel passages, because there is no direct statement. And, and there's nothing concrete that I can prove from history. Mm. So mm. one of the mm. things we need to identify, and this is really important, because I want you to think about, like everybody here to think about what happens when we um, build our corroborative evidence in our brain, that no matter how much we present or how much we put together as proof of our hypothesis, you can never be sure. You can never be 100%. But the problem is, this is what happens. And this is what happens all the time. We establish something which sounds good, it seems to fit, we build a lot of corroborative evidence. Everybody seems to agree and everybody starts talking about it. And it goes from our guess in our brain to our theory and we put it into a fact box. We make it a fact. And we do that in our head. And a classic <clears throat> example of that. It's like you're doing YMCA there too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, <laughs> Sorry, cut you short. Come on. <laughs> so a classic example of this, and I think it's a great example of this, is um, evolution. 
creation and evolution. So out there in the world at the moment, you've got a theory called evolution. Now, evolution has never been proven or observed in a scientific way at macro level. It has at at, at um, micro level within organisms, and a classic example is this coronavirus, but at micro level, things evolve, organisms evolve. But at mm. macro level, mm. in biology, where you've got species and different things, there is no evidence of evolution, no observed evidence. And yet, it is being taught within our schools and within society as not a theory, it is being taught as a fact. You right. will never yeah. hear David Attenborough say, we think that 52 million years ago as man developed from the Taipan monkey, that never happens. He says 52 million years ago, man developed from this and something mm. happened. And so we'll it's just remind people we're on about prophecy here. So if you've got any angry thoughts about evolution, maybe save them for later on in the night. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, the 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 point is is there's a classic example of how a theory gets treated as a fact, yeah. and the problem is is we need to understand when we are in the mode of hypothesis because if we put hypothesis into the fact box what we do is we deny ourselves the ability to see the paradigm shift to see the greater picture to see there might be a whole nother way to look at this and your example with the disciples with jesus is a great example mm. their hypothesis about messiah and what jesus would do had gone from a, 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 um, a theory into a fact so that when Jesus turned around and said direct statements, it made no difference. They would right. not listen. Yeah. They could not listen. They could not understand and they could not see the bigger picture. So, right, let's get <laughs> into our final bubble banter chart. <clears throat> Time shorter, I think we should just open this right up. Maybe Ron, because we're yep. running real short on time. So let's let's just open this right up. So there's not there's not a lot of verses, and that is we all know this prophecy. So this prophecy is, you know, the, the chapter is made up of multiple verses, but the verses regarding um what this vision was. <laughs> is about only uh, are only in about six or seven verses so if you uh you know you got your bible daniel chapter 2 verse 37 see if you can find these things what are the direct statements in this section are there parallel passages that you can think of um what might be inferred conclusions there's some examples there regarding the empires being sequential or maybe the image standing or the stone being jesus um and what about hypothesis where do you think hypothesis starts with this vision and this theory so have a quick um chat and maybe anybody can put up on the chat bubble or even turn on your mic and yeah, make, yeah. open uh, up your uh, microphones i reckon get some people involved feel free and, don't be uh, shy yep maybe run run back to that first slide first ron let's have a look at the direct statement i think direct statements what what yeah. are the you know what what can you see in terms of direct statements who's got their mic on there someone want to put their mic on and see what direct statements they can find there there's a bit of a hint there, isn't it? Gold. Who is that? I think you've got it. Verse 38, you are this head of gold. Who's the head yep. of gold, though? Well, he's talking to um, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, exactly. That's that's the direct statement and that whole explanation of this, this vision, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The only direct statement is to the king, Nebuchadnezzar. And that's who this whole right. prophecy is for. So you can identify 
and you can be rock solid as saying the head of gold is the king of Babylon, but you can use an inference that it's not just talking about um, a king mm -hmm. because it says after you shall arise another kingdom. kingdom. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. whilst, whilst the direct statement says you Nebuchadnezzar are the head of gold, the inference, isn't it, is that it's not just talking about Nebuchadnezzar himself, it's talking about his kingdom because the next part of the prophecy says after you shall arise another kingdom. So you can see what you can do. You can highlight one's a direct statement, one's an inference based on the direct statement. Yeah. Anybody got else, uh, ones they can think of in there? Three, two, one, nah, let's go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all direct statements. Oh, we made it too quick. <clears throat> what about parallel passages? Like there's a lot of uh, metals and stones and actually the statue form. Are there any parallel passages that come out to people? That might be might be a really, you might say a, a, a really good parallel passage in context. Yeah. What, what one are you thinking of, Ron? I was thinking of the one in, in later on in Daniel, where it says in uh, in Daniel chapter eight, and it says, uh, oh, verse twenty five on uh, yeah yeah. Verse 25, Daniel chapter 8, by cunning he shall make deceit prosper in his hand. With his own mind he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many. But he shall rise up against the prince of princes and he shall be broken, but not by human hand. So mm -hmm. I think that's a pretty good <clears throat> picture going on yeah. of breaking somebody. Mm -hmm. And it says standing up against the prince of princes, breaking them by without hand. So by context, I think you could put those two passages together with the stone yeah, yeah. and Daniel chapter eight and yeah. say, yeah, pretty good parallel passage. So there's yeah, one. The destruction of the two seems to have the same kind of event happening to it. Yeah. Yes. And, breaking and, up without and, human hands, etc. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, and it seems to conclude with you know the um, you know the establishment, if you say, of of God's kingdom as such. But <clears throat> so um, anybody else got any comment? Um, what about hypotheticals? What do what do you think in terms of hypothesis? Where do you sit with hypothesis in this vision? Where does it start from? Who the feet and toes are. Yeah, yeah. So who who do you think they are? Like if you came to it with a blank slate, who do you think that the feet and toes would be? Something that came after the kingdom of iron. Right. Why 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 do you make that sort of what's the um well because the going down through it, it says there's one of gold. Um, there's an inferior one, there's one of brass, there's one of iron, and then it says the right. iron and toes come after that. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. is there a separate kingdom that. though? <laughs> like is there any mention of another kingdom? Well it says it will be a divided kingdom. <clears throat> so the iron is a divided kingdom, yeah. <laughs> but isn't there another hypothesis in in all the other metals Whereas Nebuchadnezzar was told with the gold, you are the head of gold. But then he says, there is others coming after you. <clears throat> doesn't say who they are. Oh, this is, I like this one. Yeah. But you use parallel passages to build on that because it talks about another kingdom inferior to be coming after Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> and then if you go over to chapter five, it's got the historical context of what happened. And it says the kingdom is given to the Medes and Persians. 
So right. that, that's, a, that's a very good parallel passage, Ruth, but the question still remains where you get a time frame in that it says, after you shall arise another kingdom. The assumption or hypothesis that you've made is that it's talking immediately after the very next kingdom, i.e. the Medes and Persians. Now, I'm not debating what you're saying. I'm just saying when you think about it, and I think Dad's right, is that other than the head of gold, you start into the realm of hypothesis. Now, you can establish corroborative evidence to start saying it's the Medes and Persians based on parallel passages, but you've made a guess and you're building corroborative evidence. So you're still in the realm of mm -hmm. hypotheses mm -hmm. on everything following the head of gold. Now, I think that's important to understand because the problem like with that is that when you've made that assumption on hypothesis and you're absolutely convinced it's the Medes and Persians, the Greeks and Romans, then you don't look at that prophecy any other way. You don't allow your mind to explore the possibilities is that actually what this prophecy is about or if it is, is there another way to look at it? So so I, I think the I think Dad's right in the sense that once we understand where the hypothesis is. Yeah. But it, they are still parallel passages as well, which we did say was a one way of looking at prophecy. Yes. We yes. need some background to be able to look at a parallel prophecy or parallel no, no, passage no. and say, I think that fits in. <laughs> No, no, but it's a little bit, a little bit like what I was saying with the Barnabas story and the rich young ruler. So I, I totally agree with you that you can come up with something which, so you're, you've, you've come up with um, the idea that it's talking consecutive kingdoms, that it's talking about what immediately followed Babylon, which is the Medes and Persians. So, and now you're finding the corroborative evidence from that, and. And just the problem with that is that you still have to understand that you're still, no matter what, you're still in the area of hypothesis, not fact. And I think that's important because how do we teach this prophecy? Do we teach this as fact or do we teach this as, you know, we believe these things based on this, but we cannot be 100% certain other than the head of gold. Um, what's Darren got here? Darren's got 10 toes throw, uh, throw people. People start guessing about what the 10 toes are. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Once you get down to the 10 toes, I'm going to tell you something else a little bit that's hypothesis. It never says it has 10 toes. Ooh. <laughs> so there's a massive assumption saying there's 10 toes, but then all of a sudden again, like Ruth would say, you go to a parallel passage, chapter seven and it says you've got a beast with ten horns but it's a great idea and 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 like well, most people have ten toes but then again there was a man who stood head and shoulders and he was like this image he was a very powerful man and he represented the kingdoms of men in every sense and he had 12 toes he needed the extra toe to stand taller <laughs> or he came from he came from a whole lot of people that had 12 toes and his name of course was Tobias. so so you know again just like all i'm saying is in terms of the fun of reading it identifying where you're in hypothetical where you're in the land of guesswork as to where you're in the land of fact mm. um and, and once you know that then you're open to, I suppose, talk about these things. Can I throw another yep. hypothesis in? Why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The picture you've got up on the screen is one that usually is depicted, but and we believe it to be Jesus Christ hitting the the, the image on the feet. But we are told that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. He's the foundation stone. You don't get a block of stone like that as a found. No builder would use a stone like that as a foundation stone. 
he is cut out. It says also that he's cut out of the mountain. So yeah. you you don't get a rough stone like that cut out of the mountain. Yeah, excellent. So yeah, no, just another one to sort of um, talk yeah. about. And 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 like I mean, what we want to do is um, you know we we will we will. Uh, develop on these things a little bit more as we go okay. through this series. So we just threw that out there as a bit of a background into how we come to know things. And, and with that, we're going to develop in this series and we're going to start looking at some, you know, a bit more detail in terms of patterns and structures upon which okay. to build our understanding on. Yep. yep. So let's just run through our summary. Reese. Mm. Oh, brilliant. Summary there. I, I think this leads straight back to your point, Ron. Um, these are, are tools and techniques. So my current understanding of prophecy and the Bible uses all of these tips to develop that current understanding. And it's not to say that's the correct one. It's not to say anybody else is allowed to have something different because all of these ways of of using direct statements, parallel passages, et cetera, et cetera, can increase my own current understanding. And maybe just as Ron said, 30 years ago, he had a different understanding and now it's developed. It's developed because of these tips that we're providing you too. So I think that's that's what I get out of tonight, is all these, these tools that we've offered to you, they're just helping you to develop your own understanding of prophecy and to give you your own confidence and your own purpose with prophecy from the Bible. Excellent. Thank you, Reese. Well, my summary would be this, um, like in terms of the key point that I really wanted to sort of get across or that I've come to sort of see, and it comes back to John Popel's circles and lines. I think when you look at circles and lines and what he said, which was really fascinating, you know, everything in terms of what we see about us and in, in nature appears to have circles and cycles. Um, and they don't have beginnings and ends. And and that when we when we base conclusions upon a hypothesis, we're really in a circle because we haven't got the clear points. So what happens with when you're using the other methods in interpreting prophecy is you're putting the peg, you're putting the market down as clear points. And we're gonna look at this when we look at structure. Um, but there's one thing I wanna say, and this is but, the big but, <laughs> when it comes to it's all of this about, about hypothesis. And I, I don't want people to get me wrong in when I'm talking about a hypothesis and being on the circle of hypothesis. And that is, who doesn't love a Ferris wheel? I mean, like, <laughs> and hypothesis, I believe, should be exciting. It should be fun. It should be something we talk about. And there's a few people in our meeting that I talk all the time to about my ideas and theories. And there's a whole lot of people I wouldn't talk to about it. Uh, and, and it shouldn't be that way. We should be able to just share in our thoughts and what what we hope to do as we go through this series is in the first four series we're going to just deal with the tools and techniques for interpreting prophecy whereby we can find the markers where we can put the markers and join the dots and be fairly solid of where these prophecies are uh, you know uh, could go based on direct statements or based on structure or based on the biblical language around it. When we do the next part of this series, after we have a four week break, we're going to come back again in November and we're going to do a second series. I think what we'll do is particularly the last two parts of the series, um, we'll open up for, I, I, I can, share with you some of my i suppose <laughs> hypotheses based on where the structures are and we can talk about them because i have lots of stuff i'd love to share but i'm not going to share those with you over these four <laughs> first four weeks we're just going to lay the pattern of prophecy so from here where do we go next week we're going to look at 
what is a real key thing in interpreting prophecy is understanding structure. So there is a structure in prophecy that goes over and over and over again. And we see that structure and that pattern, look for it because you need to kind of see that that pattern is exactly what happens all the time. And God has set that structure for us to understand. And then there are symbols which are used consistently and, and understanding what some of those symbols are. And so we're not just guessing willy nilly what it means in terms of when it talks about beasts out of earth or beasts out of the sea or dragons or what it's talking about horns or these things so we've got some really good stuff to talk about symbols very good thank you everybody brilliant uh, thanks ron god bless thank you very much reese for mm -hmm. all of that that has been good um Perhaps we could, uh, if Leo's still on, we could ask Leo to close with prayer um, and then people might like to open up their mics for discussion. Let us pray. Great and wonderful Father in heaven, we once more come before your throne of grace to truly thank you for giving us this quiet time around your word. Holy Father, we've been able to open the pages of Scripture and we pray that everything that we've said and did tonight would have given honour and glory to your mighty name. For that is our aim and purpose in life, to do your will and to glorify your name. Holy Father, as we now separate, we pray that at all times you will be with us, that you will put your arm around each and every one of us and keep us safe that you will keep us in your bubble and that we will at all times be close to you we pray for your blessing to be with those who are very sick and in desperate need of your help we pray that you will care for them and we know that there is many that we are not even aware of but in the same token you know each and every one and we pray for your blessing to be with them. Guide and direct us, Holy Father, for we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.